Can we spend an entire podcast going through hunting douche and <laughs> hunting douche just, and just naming the people that we know who are like that? No, that could be really dangerous. Oh, it could be amazing. We'd have no friends left. <clears throat> right. Other than each other and whoever runs hunting douche. I want to find out who <laughs> runs hunting douche. I think it'd be really interesting. I think the amazing thing about it is, like, I don't know. Are we actually we're going to start the podcast talking about hunting? Douche? I mean, I am recording, so we yeah, could we, well. we could we could start with. I this. think it's fascinating. I think you can, like. Welcome to the Into Wilderness Podcast. I'm your host Byron Pace. It is the twentieth of January, twenty twenty two. We release these shows every two weeks, alternating between the Living with Nature series. And the longer form conversations like we're going to have on this episode with a host of different people from all around the globe. In this show, I sit down with friend and dear manager, Sam Thompson, who has graced us with his voice and presence on more than one occasion already over the last five, six years. As always with Sam, this is equal parts entertainment and informational. This podcast is produced in partnership with the publication Modern Huntsman, which is released biannually. Our latest volume is dedicated to the conservation efforts on the continent of Africa, tackling stories from elephant hunting in Botswana to anti-poaching efforts in Mozambique. You can get your copy now on modernhuntsman.com. And if you're a Patreon supporter, you also get 15% off. So head over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace. And that is a perfect segue into thanking the top tier Patreons this month, who include... Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RDContracting.co.uk, James Marchington, the guys at South Esher Stalking, Thomas Cameron, Mark Sabrowski, and Colin Knight. Please welcome Sam Thompson back to the show. So I was having this chat with someone relatively recently about like about six years ago, I was involved, I did some guiding on an event which was like quite product heavy and there was all journalists and different people and bits and bobs there. And that was in 2015. So when's that? Seven years ago? Oh, yeah, we're in 2022. Yeah, we <laughs> are, this. Um, so, yeah, seven years ago. And seven years ago, the idea that there would be enough of a social media Instagram hunting world thing, that there would be pages on Instagram taking the piss out of pages <laughs> on Instagram entirely about hunting, and those people would have millions of followers, it would just be completely unheard of. Then everybody was excited because, like, Jagd and Hund magazine were there. Yeah, and like you, the, as <laughs> as old and kind of archaic in the best kind of way, I guess, um, as you can get. I mean, very yeah. down the line stalwart of uh, the German publishing world. Well, yeah, and it's the same. I don't know. I think it's really interesting. I wonder if print, and this is probably a bad thing to say to a man who's involved in a magazine, isn't it? I wonder where the print, like the print journalism. I remember someone saying to me years ago that. Um, uh, what was it? Print media is dead, and I read that on the internet. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what a great line. Um, I think the hunting world is just a fascinating place for it because you've there isn't those there isn't those writers now, and I speak as someone that's done a little bit of writing in our little world. There isn't those writers now that there was when I was, uh, and you know, you we're pretty similar age. Those guys like the Giles Catchpoles and. John Humphreys, who used to write for the Shooting Times. Oh, yes. And probably like the the American equivalent of that. It's your Jack uh, O'Connors. Yeah, your Jack, yeah, exactly. Those people who are like not necessarily, well, they weren't professionals. Um, you know, there's, uh, what was his name? Was it, uh, it wasn't Giles Catchpole, but like one of the teachers at Sebba School, he wrote in the Shooting Times, he wrote books. Um, our friend Jago Miller's dad, who wrote books about ducks and things, and, mm. and really like is slash was an authority on that. And he, those people had such a knowledge or maybe knew that they didn't have such a knowledge. So wrote in this very lovely way. And I think that's really changed. Um, I think like the, the, the people, however you get into magazine writing now, like I say, in the, like in the shooting you world and the, whatever it is, however that is, must've changed so much because of social media and the presence and the, this and the, that and the other. And I think it, the the quality of the content has generally suffered. There's Definitely. exceptions, yeah. and I think like, and you and I, you and I are a prime example of like. There's now, I think there's now more of a place of, for like a philosophical conversation, um, about things. 
I think that's probably that happens more, maybe. But, I think but that's then also, it probably doesn't almost, in the mainstream. All, but that's also kind of going back to how it works. That's kind yeah, of going really back to ago. some of that old school uh, writing and, and thought process and being more of a more of a naturalist or, or a naturalist first and a hunter second. And and I think we're seeing an evolution of that now that was definitely lost. And I think, and I can't, I've had this discussion with one or two people before. I think that some of the reason that that was lost was the the increased commercialization of it, particularly through video. And I think a lot of that was driven out of the US with the hunting channels. And it just became this massive churn machine. It became about eyeballs on, it became about high-fiving, it became about killing shit. Yeah. And I think, a, a, and as a youngster, if that's the world that you get funneled into, and you think, and you're trying, you're trying to find these figures to look up to, and that's what you have to look up to, rather than an Aldo Leopold or an Eric Begby. Yes, to be more Lancashire about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get that. Then, then you're going to aspire to that, and it t- I think it then takes a little bit of time. So you know, it is about more than that. Yeah, um, uh, it is yeah. an interesting one, but you, you know the. It's interesting. I know a few people, uh, friends of mine, <clears throat> who are involved in the the kind of media management and, and media event organization in the hunting space. So creating events for brands, essentially to create content for product because they have shit that they want to sell. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of them have realized in the last like five years or so that some of the people that they've pulled into these events because they've seen them on social, they have a presence there and they're watching the videos that they make and the pictures that they take and they pull these, in inverted commas, journalists, like new media journalists, to these events to then talk about these products. And the difference between what is shown to the world and the reality and the substance of the people and what they've done Sometimes you're pleasantly surprised, but more often than not, from the people I know who organize these things, it's there is a, a massive chasm of yeah. experience there, which those people who used to write in, in the, the sort of you know back 50s, 60s, 70s, it was yeah. built on the foundation of knowledge rather than built on a foundation of how many people are watching my Instagram account. Very much so. I think there's two... It reminds me of a conversation I had with Tom Payne, the pigeon shooter. Oh, yes. Uh, I was speaking to him. a very long time ago. Lovely partner. That yeah. Time. Yeah. And I think, and I'm trying to remember the term, but I remember Tom telling me about being at an event and there was a guy there and everybody, you know, there was a few people having a wee chat and a dram or whatever at this thing. And they would like. <laughs> if it was Tom, it was probably ten, his 10th dram. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, they were chatting at this, like, like you say, this kind of like media event, whatever you want to call it. And uh, someone said to Tom, oh, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm Tom Payne. And Well, he's Tom Payne, so he said, <laughs> That's I, all he needs to say. I love shooting pigeons, and we'll talk about it for many days. Um, but, like, you know, he's like, oh, I'm Tom Payne, and I wrote for the Shooting Times, and I wrote a book about pigeon shooting, and what do you do? And the guy replied, like, I can't, I'd love that. Like, it was the most painful term, um, <laughs> which I've, like, since used at length, um, I'd like to say with a great deal of sarcasm. But it was like... Um, it wasn't influential. It was something wonderful. Um, but I, yeah, it was basically like, oh, I'm a big deal on Instagram. I'd love to remember the term because it was so utterly, hilariously painful. That would have um, appeared on Hunting Douche. It would have been. But the, the, so the interesting thing, and the, the second point about this, like exactly what you're saying, um, you know, all those blonde women that are sponsored by Browning. Do you remember like five years ago, if you were blonde, wore leggings and occasionally shot things, you were sponsored by Browning. And it did Browning. a massive disservice to women in the hunting Yeah, industry. well, I think so. But also like... And that comes from a lot of women who yeah. are friends of mine who were commenting on it exactly. But it wasn't... I mean, yeah. we're, we're talking about it now. Most people probably have forgotten about that. Yeah, but, but it was a genuine phase. I remember phase. it being brought up, yeah. And I think there was, that, there was that period like when I... And I think I probably got on Instagram relatively late. Um, but... There was there was not the weight of uh, people on it in our little world, so there wasn't the huge amount of people that you could now follow. So you pretty much like I remember being like, oh well, they shoot stuff, and like I'll follow them. So you follow them for a bit, and then you, I just got incredibly, and I still do occasionally. You know, you'll see somebody in the home page, the feed thing, and you're like well, who are you? Why do I follow you? And you go onto their page, <laughs> and all of the pictures on their Instagram are pictures of them. Yeah. In like a different bit of wood. 
or wearing a different jacket with a rifle, and I'm now just like, man, I'm not going to follow. Unfollow. You. Yeah, yeah, I've it's done just, that a few times. Like, it's just, it, I don't know. There's, there's nothing being added, and I think the interesting thing with you saying about, you know, the sort of the way there's now a philosophical, philosophical chat about. He hasn't even had a beer yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's now a philosophical chat about this that probably was not acceptable ten years, or not was not acceptable, wasn't happening ten years ago. If you read some of the really old books, like I remember reading a book uh, that was written a, a great deal of time ago about grouse shooting, and there was a whole chapter in this book about grouse shooting which focused very much on shooting them over pointers and setters in the very traditional way. Love it. There was a whole chapter in this book mm. slagging off driven grouse shooting. Oh, seriously? Yep. That's and weird. what a terrible, like it was a new invention. It was terrible. It was lazy. Um, it wasn't the right way of doing it. You didn't get the most out of blah, blah, blah. And it like just went to town on this. And there was a real, like that was a real thing that, you know, happened. And you, we've talked before. I don't know if we've ever talked on this, but, you know, Rich, William Scrope, uh, the stalking author, um, he, you know, the, the, there's, there's passages in his books and Augustus Grimble's books, those very early stalking books, about how it's really unsporting to have a guide. And how lazy you would be if someone did it for you, which I can't really comment on now. Um, <laughs> that's that's what keeps me in. That's uh, what you do keeps me in a job. But um, you know that, uh, and and I think the interesting thing is that at that point in the sport, it was so young, and people were so uh, it was so important to them that it it, it remained a, um, a an honest and sort of uh, morally just thing for them to be doing perhaps is the way to do it. I don't know I wasn't there it's hard to say isn't it um, but I think it's important you know it was important though clearly from what they've written and the length that they put into these passages trying to dissuade people from joining into what they thought was damaging to that sport that they were passionate about you know don't shoot driven grouse because it won't last and it's bad for the image and it's very greedy don't do that use pointers use setters like they now prob- ironically they probably were right well, we're still having the same chat, aren't we? We've we come full circle, and now yeah. we're saying the same stuff. But I, I, think- I wonder. I wonder. I mean, if if that had be if driven grouse shooting had never existed, and it had just been a, a slight evolution or an incre- an increased amount of um, space taken up by driven driven a grouse shooting with pointers, whether it would even be a debate today. Because grouse shooting is kind of the pinnacle in the UK of the shooting and society controversy. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not. Possibly. It might not even be discussed. I don't know. But equally, maybe we wouldn't be shooting grouse at all because there wasn't the money to maintain grouse moors. Very true. Hard to say, Byron. God, we've gone right in at the deep end. (laughs) I have to say that my... Having, I have never shot driven grouse, but I have been on many a driven grouse day, um, either loading or taking photos or filming or whatever. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to stand in the butts and see what a spectacle it is. Uh, if I had to pick, it would be shooting grouse over pointers. Yeah. I really, really enjoy that. There is something really beautiful and sociable about it too, especially if you're with a few people. And you know, one person goes ahead, you you get you get into a covey, you either shoot a bird or you miss a bird, and then it's the next person's opportunity. Yeah. And the, the couple of people who you're shooting with are lagging back a bit and you're having a social chat think, and it's very relaxed and assuming it's not pissing down with rain, which yeah. occasionally it is at that time of year. Think, it's a just a really a truly wonderful day. Yeah. Well, and I would completely agree with that. I love a I love a day at pointers. Um and everything you said is entirely right. That's why it's so much fun because it is so sociable and everybody can enjoy everybody shooting and everybody exactly misses right. and that's really yeah. lovely. Um, and then I would quickly follow it by saying what I don't particularly like mm. and I've never really got, I don't know, um, shooting shooting walked up grouse in lines over spaniels, I don't think. I don't really enjoy that. No, it's very hard to I've do I've done it. that and it's it's very hard work. It's very hard work, and I think it's because you're in that sort of scenario where suddenly there's kind of like a team that can be let down. I think that puts quite a lot of pressure on people shooting because they don't want to be lagging back. They don't want to fall behind, and, you know, there's all of that all, you know, 
he's shooting quite a lot or did he poach that but whatever there's not that kind of I don't know I think if you're going out to shoot 10 brace shooting 10 brace over pointers between 5 people 2 people 10 people whatever um, I think that's a really nice way that everybody kind of gets an amount of shooting that's pretty equal and there's a really like you say the gang of folk walking behind the people shooting and behind the person working the dog um that they have every bit as nice a time all the time. Whereas I think any driven shooting, if you're not in the shooting, you know, if if you're at an end of a line or whatever, and you're not, and, and obviously, you know, you cycle through and it works so that people do get shooting and all these different bits and bobs. But, um, yeah, I'd, I, I'd, I would, I would agree with you completely. Um, I, I think one of the things for me is that, um, you are, because you're, because you're pretty much, behind the person whose opportunity it is to go and walk up to the pointer that's pointing on the grouse, you're kind of invested in it with the person yeah, it's with exciting, the gun. Isn't yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. And whether it's you pulling the trigger, or this is how I view it anyway, whether it's you pulling the trigger or you're watching the person make that kind of final stalk in with the dog and then the dog going forward and making the flush, it almost doesn't matter. Yeah, and I think like so much of show much, show much. Sean Connery's here. <laughs> um, so much of virtually all, and I'm not a big, like what the Americans would call bird hunting. I'm not a particularly knowledgeable or good or experienced person when it comes to that. And um, it's not my favorite thing to do. But the bit of it I like, I like the dog work. I like the hunting aspect of it. And I think put anything with pointers or setters or, or any sort of dog like that, it's a very... It's a really exciting thing to watch. It's a very interesting thing to watch. You know, I've been to pointer and setter field trials and, you know, that, you know, just watching different dogs run and how they run and how people handle them is interesting. And I think you then combine that with a little bit of shooting, which it generally is a little bit of shooting and a bag at the end of the day, which can generally be eaten by all the people that are there. That's quite good. Um, And the ability to you know, make something of not having an awful lot of grouse, but having enough grouse to do that. It means it's something that you can do in a lot of situations and is relatively affordable for people and and generally quite good. I'm having Um, having some deja vu here. I'm remembering that I think the last time we talked, we talked about, and we're not going to talk about this today because we've we've beaten this to death with a stick. Um, (laughs) We talked about big bag days. And I think then we got phone calls from the various organizations or representatives (laughs) from various organizations in the weeks that followed about our discussion. I think we probably slagged some people off as well, like we tend to do, which is never a good idea, is it? No, that might have actually not been oh, the last discussion. It's never discussion. a good idea. It can be good fun. But, um, <laughs> it wasn't the last discussion. Let's it was, not a, it was the time the before that. The last today. time you and I uh, had a podcast, it was again the start of the year. Um, now I think you've done three starts of years. Uh, and I was at your, uh, your other place, which was in Inverness. Yeah, Jemima's Flat. Jemima's Flat. Which and is, we drank what? a small barrel of beer. And we were yeah, quite we drunk did. by the that end of it. That was great, wasn't it? <laughs> that is and not happening people, today. I literally the... only have one can in my hand and Sam has one can. And we've had a very... <laughs> civilized meal but we are a a very chef. we are a very short walk away from quite a lot of whiskey <laughs> so anything could happen um what i really enjoy about that is there is quite a few people that have booked hunting with me since and have come stalking <laughs> on what basis and are like oh well he kind of came because you're that guy that got pissed on a podcast and i was like oh yeah i, I was just like oh no um but no, that was good fun, but that was a long time ago. That was pre-COVID and things. And then there's probably been a few times since we've said, oh, we should probably do a podcast, and we haven't. And so we have. Did you, you live so far it's away, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And it's, um, yeah, and you're, and you're never anywhere. Well, I mean, that is, that, is, that is also a rather large component of why we haven't. I mean, I've seen you quite a lot recently in the last couple yeah, of months. Yeah, it's been lovely. Uh, but I haven't seen you very much in the last two years. No, because not at all. COVID and I haven't been home very and much. Travel, <laughs> yes. <laughs> international superstar Byron Pace. Well, I mean, international traveler for sure, because that's how I eat. <laughs> I don't know about superstar. Yeah. No, I think it's um, uh, it's 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 nice to be back. That's the term. It's good to have a headset on, feel like a pilot. It's nice to, for me to be back at home for a bit, as in back at Scotland when I came up. Um, to see you. It was pre at Stags, wasn't it? Oh shit! Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was like it the was back like, end of Stags. It was. It was I think October. It wasn't the change of a week. It would have been the second to last week of Stags. Probably. Yeah. Um, I had two about. really, or a couple, a handful of really nice days on. The, we weren't even shooting, or I, I wasn't no. shooting. 
we you, you had um, clients here, and I was just embracing being on the hill with mm. stags and people also enjoying their day. And it reminded me how good it is to be out on the hills in Scotland because it's so easy to take it for granted when it's literally at the back of my house. I like walk out my back door and the hills are there. Um, and I've done a lot of it over the years, but I've also been away a lot recently. But there is something very grounding and something truly magical. And it's good for me to remember that I have that on my doorstep. Yeah, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to come out in October. No, it was lovely. And it was a nice, we had a fantastic rut this year. It was, it was long, which is lovely. Um, very lucky that we had good stags holding hinds and i think when you've got that uh, when you've got that spectacle in front of you that you don't need to be stalking you don't need to have a gun you don't really need to have a camera you need a set of binoculars and then i mean i i've not done the traveling you have and i haven't seen the wildlife spectacles that you have but i think that takes a lot of eating and there's an awful lot of people that have seen the wildlife spectacles um and they still come back and they, they still say it takes a lot of eating so i can't be entirely wrong <laughs> no um, it really does there's something but equally i get excited you know i'm i am I, i've never hunted outside this country um there's been a plan for a really good friend and, and i to go over to america hopefully oh, yes, and do some different hunting time. yeah yeah um and that's something i'm really excited for and actually i there's so much I can see, and it, it's taken me a little while. I don't know. I went through a bit of a stage. The problem is when it's your job, you get all funny with it and you go through different stages and that you always basically like it. But depending on what time of year it is and the season you've had and the people you've dealt with and everything else, you get to the point where oh, the last thing on earth I want to do is go somewhere else and do this and pay for it. <laughs> um, but I've been really excited. So since COVID, we've been cut, sort of, me and my friend Richard have been kind of trying to plan, plan this trip and. It's been quite awkward for a number of reasons because we both, he's a keeper as well, he's a grouse keeper. Um, and so we're both basically off limits for the majority of hunting seasons in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and we're both quite British and we don't really want to go anywhere hot. <laughs> uh, so, so like, you know, we can go to Africa and shoot whatever you can go and shoot in Africa. And that's, but that doesn't really appeal very much. So it's been really nice for us. And I should say for the listener that the plan is that we will go uh, to Idaho. And we will go spring bear hunting uh, on public land for, and it's important I say it's on public land, as we referred earlier to hunting douche. Um, <laughs> no other sort of hunting in America matters if you listen to Instagram. <laughs> so uh, it will be over the counter public <laughs> land hunting for, for spring bears, which is great because it means we can go um, sort of in a nice quiet time for us industry wise. Um, and the plan I think is we're going to go, it'll be sort of two weeks, including traveling. So probably 10 days in the back country. Uh, another key phrase to get in there, the back country. Uh, there is no front country, is there, in America. There is only the back country. Um, but yeah, and three, then you're just going to pray for hump day. Yeah, <laughs> whatever the fuck that is, yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll go over and we'll do a kind of self-guided, um, try and get really far into some sort of cool wildernessy areas and really use it. And I think that's the thing, that both of us know the chance of us seeing... Uh, the, the the chance of us if we do see bears working out that it's a shootable bear in time to shoot it is probably really slim because my friend Richard actually has seen some bears um but I've never seen a black bear uh and I maybe have in a zoo as a child I don't know but certainly not with enough authority to tell whether that's a, a shootable bear according to their so how are you gonna work that out I've um so there's a lot of different a, the, the the honest answer is probably that I don't know. Yes, I've read quite a yeah. lot about it. I've watched quite a lot on good old YouTube, which is a phenomenal research. And this is the flip side of this. We can sit and bitch and moan as we love to do about all of That's this social media and that. Yeah. But 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 actually the amazing thing is, like, from from watching people do this on YouTube, you can gain a reasonable understanding, I would suggest, mm -hmm. of how to do it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a gateway uh, uh, that never existed yeah, before. Yeah, and like zero level of competency. And I, you know, I, I'm being slightly old fashioned as I am. I went and bought after quite a lot of YouTube a research DVD? and some <laughs> <laughs> even more old school. A VHS, Byron, a book, <laughs> <laughs> the paper film. Um, you know, so like I did a load of YouTube research and um, read lots of articles and and bits and bobs on the internet and i was like actually just because you know i come from that that 
that's probably the last generation of people <laughs> that we can read. From, well, <laughs> that like will be like, hmm, I can watch these things on YouTube, but what will really confirm in my head that it's true is a book because only published work. It's sort of like right. So I bought this book. Uh, I think it's called Black Bear Hunting. Funnily enough, I think there's a picture of a black bear on the front. It's quite a green book from memory. Um, and I read this book and I was like halfway through it and I was like, Jesus, this this book th- this book doesn't have the, inf- the level of information that I got from YouTube. And this is a relatively highly recommended book about black bear hunting. There are very few books about black bear hunting specifically. Uh, that might be because I'm not in the world to know where to find them. But from, again, looking on the internet and trying to buy good books uh, about We might about get a bunch of hunting. emails off the back of this podcast of people who are experts about black I bears. I really hope so. And can get Please you on the phone. Please do. I would love that very much. What I have been amazed at is the generosity of people who I don't know, but I know someone that knows someone's cousin that da 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 including a man that um, has offered to lend us a handgun in case we meet a grizzly bear. That's quite exciting. Um, uh, but, you know... Bear spray. I, I think there's. I, I, will, I will go for all of the things, oh. but I don't really think a pistol is necessary because I'm going to go with a really big gun. So I feel a small gun to back up the big gun is probably a slightly strange thing. But I know nothing about bears, so maybe that's why. Um, but no, I think it's amazing that you know you can watch a lot of YouTube videos cool. and you can. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I can attach it to my binocular harness. <laughs> Then I've, I've, a lot of some of them do have the little side holsters on yeah them. no yeah. the one that I use that I really like I remember when I first ordered it and I was like oh my god I can buy a holster that clips on the side I, I must do this <laughs> even and, though you can't yeah, own one can't here can't legally own a gun but I could look cool um, which I should say I didn't do so I am holsterless uh, which would be a shame if I went to America <laughs> But I I'm don't. Sure you could get the I'm, sh- I'm sure if you can get a pistol, you can get the bit of leather to stick it in, can't you? But I think it's amazing that YouTube, you know, has put me in a situation because, and it's it would be much harder to do with, uh, ironically, the other way around. If I was an American bear hunter that wanted to come stag stalking, it would probably be really hard to learn good information about stag stalking from YouTube. But you know, I've never tried. Yeah, neither have I. But what I've seen hasn't been great in the most part, with a few exceptions. That's um, how I learned how to film me. On the YouTube. On the YouTube. Yeah. There you go. There's a lot less people doing it when you learn to do it. Oh, back then. I mean, now it's full of people. It kind of makes me laugh a little bit because a lot of the, while there's some insanely good resources and some very talented people putting um, YouTube videos out, helping people um, in their... Making of YouTube videos. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, (laughs) in helping people towards being better filmmakers, there is a large proportion of... YouTube how-to filmmakers that never actually make any films. And there's a bit of me that's like, if you were actually any good, you would just go make and make films, films rather than telling people films about how to films. make films. Yeah, uh, but there are there is some some crazy good resources on there as well. And, and like, I, I wish some of them that I've seen now, like some of the a lot of the stuff I know because I've had the to learn it over, it over years. Or I, I've worked with people who have the knowledge. So I've met the people in person, and that's where I've got the knowledge from. But yeah, that didn't exist to the same depth and breadth no. as six, seven years ago. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? The bear hunting things, yeah, it's really interesting because there's so many people turning out really good videos, and they're not necessarily instructional videos, but th- as you do with these things, having done a little tiny bit of it myself, you, you, you are, you're trying to explain the decisions you've made in these situations so you're these just general hunting films that are made a lot of them have really sort of handy little nuggets of information none of which i can recall now about sizing a bear or sexing a bear or aging a bear on the hoof Mm. a long way away um so yeah it's it's going to be quite a fun it's going to be quite a fun thing to do because i think unguided hunting in areas you don't know is quite rare to the british person even someone in the industry it's It's, it's, it is unusual uh so flying around the world to then go to a place that we don't know to look for an animal that we don't know is pretty much doomed to fail like if we but shoot a bear that, right? no it's, it's not about at all. the reason for going yeah yeah exactly well I mean, also it's just a cool uh, it's it's a way to explore that landscape it's the only really way i know of exploring a landscape and getting the most out of it yeah um because i'm rubbish at going on holiday <laughs> if you get a bear, are you going to turn its um, pelt into a coat like Anthony Hopkins in Legends of the Fall? No, I'm going to turn it into a massive rug and I'm going to pray 
that none of my dogs eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I think Haggis would love to sleep on Haggis that. Haggis the sausage like dog would probably fight the bear. I think that would or, be a or, good... Or right now, Haggis the sausage dog would like some of the hair from the oh, rug so that you could that put it, it back let's not, on her body. Let's not keep that horrible <laughs> thing that I did to that poor little dog, you know, in perpetuity <laughs> in now, podcast history. I should explain I, I came, again. I came, I came this... back, uh, and it was only a matter of weeks since I'd been here, and half of his sausage dog, it's a little tackle, had disappeared. I was like, where's you? What happened to Haggis? Well, she, it, it, I, I've clipped her, I think, once before. And I clipped her and then got told by someone whose uh, fiancé is a dog groomer that I shouldn't have done that and I should have stripped it like a border terrier, which I didn't know. Um, so now I won't ever be able to strip that dog. I will only ever cut its hair and um i did quite a good i think i did it back in september and did quite a good job of it and crucially at that point had the little guard on the clippers that made it all even and then the other day it was snowy and she was very very hairy and all balled up with snow like a sheep and it was really annoying because it it wet the whole floor and i was like i'm gonna shave the dog again got the clippers didn't have the thing anymore but was like i'm sure i'd lost that before i did its hair last time (laughs) Got three cuts into the dog, and I was like, "Oh fucking hell!" And it looks, it looks like it's got alopecia. That's the I, honest answer. I mean, if you went into the barber and the barber said, "Sorry, mate, um, I got no guards for my trimmer today, but don't worry, I'll be okay." Eh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had no guards for my beard trimmer, it would be a disaster. Spoken like a true hipster. <laughs> I had a beard before the word hipster was even invented. I'm sure you did. But you did turn up to my house only wearing double denim and a neckerchief. So I feel I feel the ice is very thin. <laughs> I did wear double denim today, which is a very rare occurrence for me. But I was my excuse is I was breaking in my jacket. So if I not- thought I could do it, I could break my newish jacket in in company that I know well. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And obviously, knowing me well, you knew that I wouldn't tease you about it. Um, <laughs> of course not. Let's not I'll talk about it. This, this is incredibly dull. <laughs> um, so just going back to my little thing about going and shooting a bear or mm. trying to shoot a bear and probably not shooting a bear, which is what's going to happen. Um, with all of So with me and my absolutely no international travel slash hunting, it makes me really want to go and do this because it's different. Do you find because you've done a ludicrous amount of traveling and – all right, not necessarily hunting, but spending an awful lot of time on hunts all over the world. Does that make you, you know, does that make you want to go and shoot rabbits at home? Does it make you want to go and shoot an Ibex in a stan? Does it make you want to go and shoot a bear or a leopard or a Eland, an Eland, whatever it is, an Eland? Um, or, you know, or are you, does it make you not want to do any of it? Do, do you think it has, like, do, does Byron Pace now have a different outlook on it all? And, of course, you will do because it's a different time. But that, like, pre-getting, and you've always traveled a lot and gone to Africa and things, but that pre, before you've been, you know, you've been, what, Ibex hunting twice? Oh, uh, no, well, second time will be in a few weeks. Second time. But you, you've been to the, you went to the Himalayas, didn't you? Oh, Did sorry. I... Yeah, well, that was for Blue Sheep. Blue right, Sheep okay. and Tar. So yeah, but you know, so mountains. you've done what like yeah. two tar hunts, like yeah. a blue sheep, ibex, yeah. a lot of these like you know, uh, sort of like lifetime goals for a lot of people mm. who do some of the stuff. I should emphasize I didn't pull the trigger on any of this. No, I but was you documenting were... stuff. But I was there, and for me, it doesn't yeah. make any difference. Yeah, exactly. So you've been in that environment doing that thing. Does that make you? Are you like, wow, I really want to go and shoot an ibex myself now? Or are no, you like, actually... I've done that, but I'd like to go and do this other thing? Or it's strange because. Um... When I was a kid, I guess. But when I say kid, I mean like early 20s. You're not really a man then. You think you are, but you're yeah. not really. Um, all I desperately wanted to do was be immersed in those environments. And I, I was never so much worried about being the guy carrying the gun. Because I knew that in most of those places that I wanted to go and experience, I could never afford to do it. So my passport to those places became carrying a camera. And my pen, because yeah. I could write about it at that time, not particularly well. Didn't take particularly good pictures either, but good enough that somebody somewhere would print something. And that was how I ended up in those places. And so, yeah, I've, through that journey, had the opportunities to go to locations where not only would I possibly never have been able to afford to go myself as the hunter, 
there would also be actually, in many instances, absolutely zero reason for you to go there other than hunting. Yeah, there like is nothing else happening. I mean, there is lots of cool stuff happening in Tajikistan, but particularly where I was in Tajikistan and those mountain ranges, there is no reason unless, I don't know, literally unless you'd pick the point on the map and said, oh, this would be a cool mountain range to explore. I'll go walk up there. Yeah. Um, which would be difficult because you're walking through people's villages and it's, you know, it's, it is the only reason to be in those places. And you are, by being there for that reason, actually giving something back. I think that a lot of um, travelers who go to places because they want to experience it, it's quite a selfish endeavor. And I'll caveat that by saying that my reasons, particularly early on, was a selfish endeavor too. It's because I wanted it all. Like I wanted to experience the things that I had read in books, and I felt like I wanted a piece of that, but I wanted it to be a story that I could tell. And I think that if you are literally just a visitor in many of those places, you're not really putting anything back. You're kind of just taking. But on a lot of the trips that I've been on, which are very often hunting related, there is so much put back. You know, whether, and a lot of that is financially. Like the, the place that I was at in Tajikistan, they had taken uh, from basically when the Russians pulled out of Afghanistan, because we were on the border of Afghanistan. Right. They had taken a population of 40 Markor to 800 Markor from the 90s to now, basically because this family banded together, got a whole bunch of the, the villages on board across these six different valleys and said this is a resource and if we get hunters in to come and pay for that i can pay you not to go and kill this wild food resource because that was the only reason that there was basically like on on the afghan side there's uh, so they told me there's basically nothing left there's no ibex there's no markor it's oh. the same mountain range we were literally looking over the river to afghanistan but when the russians pulled out they left a lot of guns there and a lot of ammunition which then got into the hands of local people it's very rural, poor communities, and this was a food resource. So they were, you know, shooting these wild goats and sheep, because yeah. why wouldn't you? Um, and so that's it's an amazing conservation story there, where the 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 resource that you're putting back in as the visitor, as as a visitor who is hunting, has 100% been the catalyst and and the sole reason that they are able to protect those mountain ranges for the wildlife that lives in there. But to get back to your question, so I, I've seen that now, and it's and I think that I'm at a place, have been at a place in the last couple of years, where my biggest driver for going to or wanting to go to a location like that is to tell that story. Yeah. I honestly couldn't care less about being the guy who goes there with the rifle and taking the shot. Yeah. Like, I know that I could take that shot. Because I spend, or not in the last couple of years, but I have spent a lot of time behind a rifle. I reviewed guns for a yeah. decade. I have spent a lot of time hunting in the highlands here and in different parts around the world. And I know what I'm capable of. And I know that physically I can do that because I've done it alongside the people who are hunting. And in fact, probably had to do more work because I was filming and taking photos and stuff. Yeah. So if it's the physical challenge that you're after, I do it plus. If it's the, the skill set in shooting, yeah, okay, there is one aspect. It's like, oh, how excited do you get? Like, can yeah. you keep calm enough to be able to take a shot on, on an animal, which can be a problem for some people? It's not a problem I've ever really suffered with, that kind of like yeah. buck fever. I can tell you the last time I felt it, and it was I was backing up on a hippo hunt when I was like 20 in the Caprivi. And that's the last time that I had... And it's not to say that I don't get an excitement when I'm, when I'm hunting and, and all the appreciation that comes with it, but that like tangible adrenaline rush tasted in your mouth yeah. that I think happens, seems to be quite a common thing from some people that I speak yeah. to. I, and I have to say, particularly like some of my American friends, um, it's just not something that I, I can it, really it's relate relevant to. to. It's relevant. Trigger pulling excitement is relevant to trigger pulling opportunity. I think that might be some of it. Whereas yeah. you're only, you know, taking one, maybe two animals a year, you know, where we are here mm. and you're far more than I do, but I've had the opportunities to go and help people like friends of mine, like you, yeah. where you're shooting multiple animals in a day, but it's part of the management of the land. 
Yeah. And it's not that you're that the taking of the life means less, but the more that you, you do it, the more that you're kind of in control of what your body does while you're doing. Yeah, it. absolutely. Um, so I don't, yeah, I, I definitely don't have, there is one desire that I have. If there is one thing, and I would love to do it this year, actually. And my friend of mine, Alex Olofsson, and I were talking about it last year and actually just a couple of days ago on the phone, was I would really love to go and hunt an African Cape buffalo. Um, and I want it to be over like 14 days. I want it to be somewhere like in deep, Mozambique or Zambia um, and I want to go and experience that that whole process yeah but yeah going after an Ibex or going back to Nepal being up in the mountains and blue sheep I mean that's a very few people ever get the opportunity to hunt that and I've seen that done I don't have a desire to go and do it myself but I do have this incredible thirst to tell stories that haven't been told yeah. more. So if you ask me what my like, <laughs> like driver in life was as a, as 19 year old, I wanted to go and hunt places or I wanted to go and fish places or at least be around people who were doing it so that yeah. I could like glean a little bit of it. I care far less now about even the hunting aspect of it or even the fishing aspect or, or, or the various outdoor pursuits that I enjoy. I have a um, a desire to tell stories about the natural world and the world that we live in, but it's much more about the the human interaction and the human connection with nature. And I really get a massive kick out of being able to tell those stories. And I think that's kind of, and and maybe I'll come back to it. And I think that if there is a, a, a like a really positive takeaway about that kind of shift from my work. Because I mean, I, you are you are asking what I do for fun. That's the kind of there's a big blurring of lines because a lot of the things that I do because I would do them anyway because it's what I enjoy is also what I do for work. So I love telling those stories and I would like to do it. I used to do it when I had a different job. Yeah, you know, when I worked in finance, I was still doing that not because for the menial the amount of extra money that I was being paid to publish at that time. It was because it was something that I actually enjoyed doing. But what it does mean now is that when I do have the opportunity, like I did um, just after I saw you when we were talking about stag shooting in, in October, I went home and I was st stalking with some friends for Robux. Yeah. And I had no camera with me. It was just purely because it's something that I love to do. It was on a farm that I've hunted for 15 plus years. I was with great company and I got so much out of that. Yeah. And I really appreciated like every second yeah. being on the hill and everything that meant. And that means a lot to be able to to take those little bits of separation where I can kind of like split the work. Yeah. So it, it's it's nice that I can kind of return to that because the problem is if if it was I or the problem that I kind of started to find was if if I was making like hunting shows, which I don't, I have done in the past. If I, if that was the, my kind of work, if I was only, cause I don't even write hunting stories anymore, but if I was writing hunting stories and I was filming hunting shows and I was taking photos of people killing stuff all the time or fishing, you actually don't want to go and do it yourself. Or it becomes very difficult to do it yourself and not feel like, you should be getting more out of that. You should be posting something. You should be showing the world, yeah. hey, look. And it's, it's an easy trap to fall into. But I don't, I don't have that because it's slightly less of what I do now. So I can go out and go stalking by myself or stalking with a friend and just enjoy it for purely what it is. Yeah. And I'm glad I've kind of got back to that because I'd lost a little bit. Yeah, and I think you do. I think you go through phases where you're just like, oh, God, you know, I... It, you can do it with any part of that, like you say, that's strange. And, and we're in a very similar position in that the things that you love doing happen to be, don't happen to be because you've made it that way, but are your job. And therefore, there's times when you're like, oh, God, I could, you know, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to go out and try and shoot seeker hinds in the rain. I want to sit in the house, be yeah. dry because I've and been pet wet. my dog. 
<laughs> yeah. I've been wet for like five days, but oh, I need to go and do that. And I think the, the interesting thing with that for me is that actually when you get, generally when you get out and you get past that barrier of, oh, I should go and do that, but I can't really be asked. And you get out. I think the thinking about it is worse than the doing of it. Because as soon as you get back out, you're like, oh, I'm doing this again. And actually, I really like doing this. Yeah. So even though it's raining. There are a lot of things in life you could be doing which are not as fun. Yeah, but I think, and and I don't know. I'm in a job that people constantly remind me I'm really lucky to be in, which is an odd position. You're constantly, like, the people in in the nicest way possible, like, oh, you have, you know, you have the dream job. (laughs) And, like, that's delightful until you're having a really shit day and someone's telling you how lucky you are to have that job. And you're like, oh. Yeah, but it's also not fucking luck. Like, for you. I was having yeah. podcasting with Ben O'Brien the other day, and he was asking oh, yeah. me a similar. Like, he's got a new show out um, called Woodside, if I'm remembering rightly, and I think I'm the first episode on, on his new, hey. on his new podcast. Yeah. And we were talking about this exact thing, and I was saying the amount of times similar to what you're saying. The amount of times I have people saying, "Oh, you know, if you're going, if you're going on one of those trips, I'll come and carry your bag." It's yeah. you know, it's, it's really lucky that you have that job. It's not fucking lucky at all. And also, 90% <laughs> of those people don't want to carry that back. No, well, that's, I don't think it would last a week. No. <laughs> because it's not... Um, I, I feel very fortunate, but I don't feel... Oh, of course. I don't feel lucky. Because no. it, is one, it, it, has, it is the avenue that I have walked down, the same as you're in the job that you're in now because of very deliberate choices that you've made throughout life. Probably. Um, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I think so. Um, but you wouldn't want to carry the 23 kilo camera bag and tow the other bag and then the other two bags also weigh 23 kilos. Trust me. No. I should I'd, take somebody up I'd on probably, that one time and see how say, long they last. Yeah. But take someone up on it that looks like me rather than someone else that looks like you. I reckon, <laughs> I reckon that 23 kilo bag sounds pretty light. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's a really weird thing. And I think it's that odd, you know, we work in a non-industry that a small percentage of the people involved in think is an industry. I don't even know what I do. to most people is a community. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I don't really know what you do. At least you have a title. You have a title. Well, you, yeah, you it kind of know mean what you do. anything. Sorry, did you say you don't know what I do? Yeah, I don't really know what you do. Like, it, it, I, I can tell people what, like, I can, uh, yeah, how do you describe, how do you describe Byron Pace? I don't, well, we once, we once sat time. down in a lounge and did a podcast. It's, is, is that a job? Yeah, kind I don't. Of, yeah, like my, of da, my dad, my dad. So <laughs> to fill you in, my dad is not a man who particularly engages <laughs> within within media that isn't the Telegraph. And um, he'd listened to a podcast that Byron, probably the first one that we did years and years ago. And uh, he met Byron recently, and I was like, "Oh, I was like, oh, Dad, this is Byron who I've done podcasts with." He went, "Oh yes, the man that sells coffee." <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? But of course, like that, that you did we have did your own coffee. Yeah, yeah. And my dad, in his very like black and white, straightforward mind of a you know seventy year old man, was just like, well, Podcast he's a coffee, coffee salesman that happens to have his own very strange private radio show <laughs> that I don't understand. I was like, yeah, that'll do. So coffee salesman, that's just how I'll describe it now. Yeah, Brian I mean, Pace who sells coffee. That makes more yeah. sense. And I don't even do that anymore. No, I haven't sold coffee <laughs> for five years. It is, it is odd though. I think you, you. What is nice is that your your little niche is lovely because it means you have a great flexibility to be objective about it. And by make, by it being made or you making it so much, so much of an international thing, I think it gives it a very interesting perspective because, you know, the podcast, even since I was, I mean, we're talking like six years since we did the first one together, I guess. Maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it. like just after I'd been at Arden American. So that would have been six, maybe seven years ago, six years ago. So, uh, anyway, um, then like your podcast was a lot more British centric. You no. weren't doing the weight of international work that you now do by a long, 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 long way. Um, and I think the interesting thing is that actually you must get to a point where you've probably interviewed everybody in Britain that you, or that's not fair. The majority of people that you want to interview and have a realistic chance of interviewing, you probably run out of folk. And you, I mean, Christ on a bike, you don't want to interview me more than the bare minimum because it's I mean, only once a year. That, that's, all, that's all the world takes Sam. Yeah. And even then it's a push. Um, but I think what's nice from your point of view, that, or from what I think about your point of view, is that like that international thing, that international way of looking at it, like you say, like the, you know, your, um, Tajikistan 
Markor story, that is very relevant to many, many situations around the world. Possibly not to the same extent, possibly to more of an extent in other places. But what I think is really lovely, like you say, is that all of our, whatever we are, community, industry, business, whatever it is, it all comes down to people that are very passionate about a natural world. Yeah. And that's what I found more and more fascinating the more I've grown while being a part of that community is actually you find quite often that you, you're you not nearly as far from other communities, in inverted commas, as you thought you were. And a lot of, there's a huge amount of crossover Massive, between, yeah. you know, the people that see themselves as being hunters in a hunting community and the people that, really don't see themselves being close to that at all but actually the, the interest is probably similar um everybody just thinks they have the right way of doing it everybody thinks that they interact with that natural world in the right way whether that's because you're a hunter and you like hunting and you therefore think that's the right way of interacting with it or whether you're a bird watcher and you think bird watching is the right way to interact with it it's not the key thing is the interacting with the nature it doesn't really matter how you do it because if you're interacting then you you start to glean aspects of appreciation for its its existence. Yeah. And also... Which like, means that you'll actually do something to protect it. Well, you'd hope so. Well, you'd hope I so. think it's quite questionable. I do find it remarkable that so many people... Um, there are so many people who are passionate outdoors people and uh, hunters and all these different things and bits and bobs, but they're, they remain sort of like fundamentally opposed to, you know, stopping climate change or adjusting things to try and help the national world because they don't see that as being relevant i, th I find that really interesting um do you see that I, i'm not sure I i'm not is, particularly yeah. aware of it i think so i think it's it, it's I am possibly... aware of climate change just let me just clarify yeah. that I'm particularly aware of That's these people good. you're talking about <laughs> but yeah the, the, you know those people i think it's possibly generational to a degree um but i think there's a lot of people that maybe don't see like i see what i do uh, it, it is environmentalism like I could easily describe myself as an environmentalist. What I'm passionate about, what I work in, what I see as being the important parts of my job are mainly environmentalism. I you know, that that is, you know, conservation is is a part of environmentalism. Part of that has to be lobbying, part of that has to be trying to create social change. And part of that also has to be, you know, big ugly people like me with spades. Um but I I, I don't I, I think that I, I I think there's a lot of people that wouldn't agree with that who partake certainly in, in field sports in this country who see environmentalists as more of a problem for oh, what they're no, passionate that, that about. Is, that is I think true. that's what I'm trying to say. You know, there's yeah. a, Whereas actually most people that are fired up about the environment are probably more similar in a lot of viewpoints than, than people who are fired up about hunting. Um, would, no, would, would I, think, think. I, I think I think that's. If that makes sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? No, yeah, I, I, I can see. What These you're are saying. all the reasons we should have discussed what we were talking about first. You see, <laughs> there have been a lot of us going, hmm. but um, yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. And I think, like you say, that the, the change and the change happens in all different ways. I was reading a thing earlier about, um, you know, the RSPB at Abernethy, which, which is a uh, a nature reserve run by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. I have it to remember these things. Hosts. that Lots of people that listen to this aren't. <laughs> people in Scotland. Um, a, so that, a previous Kappa Cayley stronghold. Uh, yeah, and that's exactly it. So, you know, a, a Kappa Cayley stronghold for a long time and when there was first Kappa Cayley, when the first, I think the first funding for Kappa Cayley was in the like mid-90s, late 90s, and they got like six million quid and there was 2,000 Kappa, I think I was reading. And um, five or six years later, they ran out of funding. It was the end of the project and they said, well, uh, what, well, has it worked kind of thing? You know, there's EU funding and, and is it successful? And they said, yes, it's it's very successful. It's kind of halted the decline, blah, blah, blah. But we are down 400 birds and they'd start with 2,000 and they're at 1,600 or something like this. So we've had this decline in Capercaillie, which are very important species in that environment, um, highly protected. Um, and that decline's been fairly drastic i would say in my understanding since say the 80s um and the rspb literally just now i think within the last 12 months to two years have admitted that there is an increased badger population in abernathy yeah and they're seeing more badgers um they're seeing more other more of other mammalian predators so martins foxes and badgers 
are, are the big the big predators and of course two of those things are protected um which makes it fascinating and it does make you wonder a little bit if uh, one of the reasons, and I'm sure there are a great many, and it's not as simple as this is going to sound, but one of the reasons that those birds do better in Scandinavian countries is, in a lot of cases, they do hunt badgers, um, and that you know they they legally dig them with terriers, and you know that's they eat them as well. Very Scandinavian. I didn't know they ate badgers. Yes, I remember reading a thing by Clarissa Dixon Wright, that that great bastion of oh, yes. funny things. That the, the badger ham is quite a delicacy. The Germans eat it as well, huh. um, or did. I don't know if they still do. But you know, the, there's all sorts of interesting stuff. But I think it's nice that uh, I think certainly there's more of a mellowing in our industry. I think people of my generation are a little bit older, um, or a lot older in some cases. But you know, uh, are see less of a divide between you know well you work for the rspb and i'm a gamekeeper so we won't get on i think that's less of a thing now thank goodness i think there's good people in all of the teams there's also bad people in all of the teams um but i think that there's a general sort of going forward mentality which i think is good um but i think a lot of say my clients will be sort of fundamentally anti-RSPB, as, a, as an example. And is that just because it's been ingrained in the culture? Probably. Probably. And there's also lots of people that will swingle back to social media and the press. And, you know, it's a, it, it's all, it all gets people very fired up. And there's lots of, you know, lots of daft stuff being said and lots of things that aren't true. And, you know, I think our industry can be pretty terrible in terms of what it puts out as as content. Yeah, no, that's um, fair. And there's a lot of stuff that just isn't isn't really correct, and we peddle it, and we peddle it very, very hard. Um, I wonder if we'll see Kappa Kaley back in decent numbers in Abernethy or anywhere in Scotland. Actually, I mean, there's some places I suppose some, where they're they're doing not not to well, sound they're... miserable, but I think it's more of a time of how long we will see any of them for. I think down to predators or habitat, because the habitat surely the habitat that's suitable for them surely must be increasing now. Um, I don't know enough to to tell you if there's an answer and if that what that answer is. That's mm. my honest answer is that I just don't know. I don't know if there is an answer. I don't know if there's a solution that will work to get them back. Personally, I think it's probably habitat predators and disturbance. I think disturbance changes. Disturbance is a, big, is a big part of it, particularly um, when they're lacking. Yeah, mm. and you know we can't close public access, and I think that's something that we should be able to do for a species so threatened and so important as that. Um, we can't. You know something that they do do in other places that is that they review the protection of a certain species. So the badger, for example, and they're culling them in England because there is an overpopulation. So why, you know, if they can cull them for TB in areas where they farm dairy cattle, why on earth couldn't we cull them for capercaillie protection in areas where there's lots of badgers and not very many capercaillie? Good question. Um, and I'd, uh, sadly, I don't think that's ever going to be a conversation. I don't even think that's a conversation that the people that have these conversations will be willing to have because th- it's too prickly. It would just waste time because the answer of no will be so short and so hard. I wonder but, if anyone's actually doing a study on predation <laughs> of nests by um, in Abernethy now. I don't know about Abernethy. I know that Kathy Fletcher, oh, is really? a GWCT scientist, yep. I know she uh, has done some very interesting work on Kappa relatively recently and I'm not a man that is fully up to speed to it. I might have to get her on. Kathy, yeah, she'd be a great person to get on would be Kathy Fletcher. She's a very knowledgeable person. Interesting person. Tell me about the seeker here. Because that's actually the reason one of the reasons that I've come up for this trip is tomorrow we've got a, a day on the hill with a rather fine chef we cooked for us tonight. Um and we're gonna be hunting seeker. Yes, I hope so. Um so I'll give you a bit of We'll give a full bit of background, not for you because you know, but for um, the listener. Um, so I, uh, at the sort of, uh, in the early spring of last year, um, made a bit of a change and took uh, a job as the head keeper on the estate we're sat on at the moment where I live. Um, it's a just shy of 20,000 acre, fairly traditional mixed Highland estate. Um, I think we've got about 10% forest cover. Um, and the predominant management objective is is, is a traditional mixed Highland estate. So, um, we stalk red deer on the open hill. Um, we put effort into trying to produce grouse 
which we didn't have any to shoot last year, but hopefully in future years we will have some to shoot with pointers, like we were talking about earlier. Uh, and we have a, you know, we have a small bit of a salmon river. We have lock fishing for trout. Um, it's a, it's a very, very lovely place. It's somewhere I'm very, I am very lucky to work. Um, I'm very happy working here, and it's, it's a, it's a fantastic spot. Um, but one of the things that we do have that in some ways is not so positive and in other ways perhaps is, is that we have quite a large population of Japanese seeker deer. Um, so we're in, the, we're, we're in north of Inverness here um, and Japanese seeker deer are fairly well spread through the northern highlands. I'm trying to think where the highland line is. And the, I mean, the seeker deer in Newton Moor, which are relatively low mm -hmm. down and then those seeker deer go across towards fort william and then um, down the west and then uh, I mean, they're yeah. in tweed valley so, yes they're in, they're in the tweed valley valley which is the, so they got out i think that was an escape so the japanese seeker deer got into britain because it was brought as an ornamental species like so many things were and then they escaped and then they have uh pro pro proliferated <laughs> pro proliferated had profit a role in my head <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah so they they, they have expanded their range um, exceptionally well um they're, they're a very well adapted species to our climate that is essentially the thing they they do exceptionally well here um and so there was a few different parks that they escaped from in the in the in the north highlands um and different populations have sort of linked up they're predominantly a forest deer you do see them on the hill in some places more than in other places. In Ireland, they get a lot of them way out on the hill. Don't they? There's an awful lot of hybridization in Ireland as well, which is fairly... The only hybridization that I'm aware of in Scotland is down in Argyll. So the peninsula that goes down towards Campbelltown, where Tarba is. Now, were you saying to me, because we were talking about this last time I was here, that their thinking now was that this was when they they were expanding their range and there just simply wasn't that many seeker, and it was kind of forcing mm, hybridization. Yes, um, I'm fairly reliably informed it, that the predominant reason there was seeker hybridization in that um, part of the world, so in that sort of Argyle area, was because, and we're talking in the in the probably seventies, eighties, early nineties, before my time. Um, uh, there was hybridization occurring because the Forestry Commission was shooting, who own an awful lot of land there. They're a major landowner, is what is now called Forest and Land Scotland, but was at the time called the Forestry Commission. Um, they had a very hard line on deer populations. They were shooting red deer stags all year round, out of season. Um, they were not shooting red hinds all year round, out of season. Um, and so the way that seeker deer expand their range is that the young males are pushed out and they sort of, you know, go exploring if you like. Um, so there was these young male seeker trundling about in deep, dark forestry blocks in Argyle and they were finding groups of red hinds and no red stags. Uh, and so these hinds would stand for the seeker. Um, there was quite an extensive study done at the time to see the extent of it. There was a lot of worry about it. People were fairly concerned that it would, um, dilute the, the gene pool of red deer in Scotland and introduce, you know, a, a non a non red deer gene. Um but that seems to be very limited. You see you see very little hybridization or, or I'm I've aware never seen it. a very little hybridization. I don't think I've ever I've seen, seen a live he hybrid yeah. seeker red that I'm aware of. Um but it's not particularly expensive because generally they haven't expanded in those same circumstances. Um, and so somewhere like here where we have a quite a large population of seeker deer and a good healthy population of red deer, I think the chance of hybridization would be slim. I would never say it because wouldn't happen. Because they stick to their species. Yeah. Um, and you see red deer and seeker deer mingling. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, you know, we've had seeker stags way out on the hill with red stags. Um, We've had seeker hinds way out on the hill with red hinds. Um, but we I'm not aware of any hybridization that has happened here. Um, but in Ireland, it's been quite extensive, and I don't know enough about it to tell you why that is. Probably because the of how land ownership and hunting works over there and declining red populations or whatever. Um, but we do have quite a heavy, quite a heavy seeker population here in the woods. Um, we've started doing, so when I came here, I was very aware we had 
just through the signs of the habitat, had um, quite a quite a population of, of woodland deer. Um, and I think quite a population of seeker as well. And not to the extent that some places do, but but a good amount. Um, and so we've, we've been quite hard on them. Um, we've uh, we implemented an in-season uh, zero tolerance policy. So there's no management of the seeker other than if it's in-season and it's, you know, safe to shoot. Just to try and bring that population down uh, and try and get it to a level that I think is slightly more sustainable um because obviously i don't think they you know as i've said i don't think there's a competition with the red deer in terms of hybridization but i think there is definitely a grazing competition you know course, it is more mouths mouth to, to feed, feed yeah. um red deer being our native uh, or one of our two native deer species um i i would rather have the i would rather have those mouths being native red deer mouths than Japanese seeker deer mouths. Interestingly, as well, this is an area that um, historically, you know, we're talking Victorian stalking books uh, talk about, you know, shooting a good number of, of seeker deer. And indeed, you know, speaking Even then. to people. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, gosh, uh, a good number of roe deer. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we clarified that. Yeah, uh, a, g- a good number of roe deer. And indeed, yeah. in, you know, well into living memory, there was more roe deer here and, and they were shot in small numbers. Um, you think the seeker have pushed them out now? I don't think the seeker have pushed them out as much as I think they potentially have browsed them out a little bit. Ah. I have seen a very few roe deer here, but not, not what I think. Their browse line will be higher. Their browse line is higher and, and they are, like I say, just a very successful um animal in that environment um so i'd like to think if we can reduce the seeker population slightly we might see a bit of a kick in our roe deer population which would be lovely mm. but honestly i think um i think it's a fairly uh steady uh job in that i, I think we're going to be you know we will we'll continue this uh shoot on site policy in season um next season definitely we still have you know we've we've well, they've shot nearly. Well, we've shot nearly sixty seeker hinds now. Well, they've shot, certainly shot nearly fifty uh, seeker hinds plus calves. Um, and my target uh, at the start of the season was was fifty seeker hinds. Um, and uh, you know, I think if we can deliver that along with our red deer cull and the various other things that we have to do, and I'm lucky that I've got a very good team uh, here with me. The three other guys that um, very helpful, two trainees keepers uh, and an underkeeper so um we're quite well staffed and uh, and there's uh, you know there's there's good effort being put in to achieve that cull but realistically it's like all things in in this job it's it's nothing's quick it'll take us a good long time and i think realistically the seeker are probably here to stay i don't think we're going to extirpate them i don't think we'll reduce the numbers um to a level of concern for their welfare you know um I don't think they're ever going to be in trouble sort of thing because they're, they are very, very successful. Even now, you know, you, you can see red calves and uh, in quite quite poor condition. We've not had a particularly hard winter at all so far. Touchwood, what is it, the, the 12th of January, mm-hmm. isn't it? It's not been as hard as it previously has been by this time of year. Um, but the seeker calves and the seeker hinds generally look in much better condition than the red calves and the red hinds. Is that mostly because they are more forest dwelling possibly but we have red deer that are um, yeah i suppose you do don't you? that are pretty much exclusively forest dwelling and and i bring up seeker i mean what a great piece of background because they are particularly good eating and what we are doing one of the things we're doing tomorrow is actually hoping to get a seeker or two to add to the seeker that you've already shot which are potentially or they are going to a restaurant in edinburgh <laughs> Um, How did that so, come about? I mean, a lot of I should preface that by saying that pretty much all of the the venison that goes from places like where we're sitting now, this estate, goes either directly or via game dealers to the food chain in some some manner. Yeah, absolutely. Whether that be but restaurants is, here or on the continent, it's a large scale scale food chain. What we are experimenting with here probably is the right term. Uh, we're lucky that the estate here has a game dealer's license, so we can sell skinned game um you know sort of initially processed game as well as so skin off yeah skin off uh deer as well as deer in skin so normally you would sell your deer in skin to a game dealer who would skin it they would butcher it they would process it into perhaps sausages burgers 
uh, charcuterie, whatever, and then they would sell that to Sainsbury's or Morrison's or, you know, the farm shop around the corner or a butcher or whoever who would then sell it on to the public. Um, because we have that license here, we are able, um, with some of our carcasses, we still use a game dealer. Uh, we have a really good local game dealer here who we use and, and um, they probably take the majority of our deer still. Um, but a few years ago, um, a lovely chap who probably is going to be heard from at some yeah, point. Yeah, hopefully we're going to record it. Um, well. Lloyd Morse, uh, who's a he's a chef. He came stalking with me as a guest a few years ago to kind of see what it was all about. Is that uh, how it started? I didn't realize. Yeah, we kept in touch um, from that. And Lloyd always wanted um, to buy whole venison carcasses. I was never in a position before I was here to sell them to him. Uh, having never been on an estate with a, a game dealer's license or been given enough responsibility to make those sorts of decisions. Um, so when I came here, I uh, discussed with the estate owner and we sort of had quite a long chat with Lloyd and essentially came up with a, a, a bit of a system where we would sell whole Seeker carcasses skinned. And Seeker, as you say, a kind of the connoisseur's choice of venison, I think. It, it, it's the venison eater's venison. Um, although I'm told Muntjac is excellent and I don't really know we haven't got any of those um, but the seeker is it, it, they are a very fatty deer which it's gets chefs very, even excited. to the untrained eye it is very obvious yeah. and I think to the untrained eye people quite often would think it was lamb or, or something else you can you know we can get a, a, a seeker haunch here that's got two inches of fat on the outside of it it's still you know it's still venison it doesn't marble through it but you do have a, a, a much a higher percentage of fat than most of the species. And again, it tastes good. <laughs> it, it is tasty. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of that is they're a wooden deer. They're out of that weather. You know, they've got good grazing here. They're not particularly high pressured in that we haven't got, you know, um, we don't have a huge footfall of access takers or yeah. road. Or so they're not there. running around all the time, keeping no, out the way of people so. and dogs. And no, exactly. All that um, so I think they're quite happy, stress-free deer in the most part, um, which probably helps. But, we, you know, the, the the carcasses that we produce from the Seeker are, are in, in my opinion, particularly good. Um, and so Lloyd got very excited by this. And to make it worthwhile, I got a, a couple of other restaurants involved uh, that he knew chefs at or owners of or whatever. And so we've been sort of experimenting with taking uh, a small delivery certainly by game dealer standards of carcasses uh down to different restaurants in edinburgh who buy, buy them whole they process them themselves as they like into joints and you know they they'll make sausages and burgers and different bits and bobs um as, as they need to but yeah i mean you know they could cook the whole thing on a, on a spit it doesn't matter uh, and what That's it means so cool that it, it, and i will it, speak to lloyd a bit more about that tomorrow but i mean he can literally say if he is asked in a restaurant he can tell the people eating exactly where it came from and yeah. the fact that he's walked these hills. Yeah, as you know, tomorrow Lloyd will come out stalking with us and he'll he'll um he'll watch me you know, hopefully if things line up properly, potentially shoot a deer or two. Um he'll see that growlicking process, he'll see how we lard them. And Lloyd's been to the estate before and you know he's seen a bit of it, but um he'll really he'll he has a a fairly unique handle i'd suggest and a lot of that is is all power to lloyd because he's also done that with you know the lady he buys his sheep from yep um and where he buys his chickens so you know a lot of that is because he's taken those steps to you know put himself out there and make sure that he can have those opportunities um i would never stop you know any of the guys that are buying venison from us would be more than happy to show them the same thing i'm um, excited to go to his restaurant and see see the final stage of it being presented to people yeah. in his restaurant, having seen the carcasses here in the larder. Yeah, That's I think that would be exciting. lovely. I, I actually haven't been to the restaurant yet because it's in Edinburgh and I don't go there very often. So. <laughs> neither, neither do I, but I'm going to make a special trip. <laughs> um, I, yeah, and so will I at some point. Other than the airport. <laughs> um, and I'll I'll go and probably not eat any of the venison, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you eat it all the time. Yeah. That's like um, 90% of the meat in my freezer is venison, so I probably would have the <laughs> lamb. <laughs> um, but I think it's really nice. It's really nice for any number of reasons. It's nice from a stalker's point of view, in my opinion. Um, that there's somewhere you can really be proud of your carcasses going. That you know, 
it's not just a word your carcasses go. Oh, they go to the game it's dealer. Like black and hole then, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. S- someone eats them somewhere. And then someone eats hope. them somewhere. Yeah. And like that's great. Um, it's nice that here we're able to say, well, actually, you know, you can eat them in these restaurants. Yeah, that's very cool. Which I is cool. That. Um, and it's nice that they're getting, you know, I the, the, even you know even in inverted commas the seeker deer who we are, you know, shoot very hard. We're not we're not managing for them. We're managing. And arguably, you don't manage for any deer. You you manage, um, you know. I remember someone telling me once that you know, dairy farmers are, are really people that keep grass and happen to have cows on them. It's a bit like that. You're you, managing land. You're managing an environment and an ecosystem that happens to profit certain species. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, the the seeker deer are not what we're managing for, but we still have a great deal of care. We're still very bothered about doing it right we want them to harvest them um uh humanely and as kindly as possible and as cleanly as possible and we want to put the highest quality venison out from that um and i think it's really nice to know that the people in that next step because it's direct you know the estate here is invoicing the restaurant there's no middleman um we've got a really nice uh, a small business down in edinburgh called route to market who specialize in delivering produce um and we you know they come up in a refrigerated van we fill it with carcasses we have a crack with them lovely delivery driver then zooms off down to edinburgh and drops them off at the restaurants and they go and hang in you know lloyd and his um compatriots um cold rooms i think that's great i think it's really um it's really nice that you know so firstly the estate is um is making more money which is always good yep um it it makes the venison um side of of the the estate business um much 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 more attractive than it is selling especially after covid and the big the big price drop we had um ironically because restaurants closed yeah and so game dealers were were left without much of an outlet for their their carcass it just so, showed you though that Clearly, it is, it is driven by the eating out market rather than the eating in market. Absolutely, and that's should, something. Yeah, that needs to discussed. kind of that needs to be addressed in the longer term. Massively so, and mm. there's been I know there's been those chats for quite a while with the is the Scottish Venison Partnership. Yeah, that? there's the Scottish Venison Partnership, and there is the Scottish Quality. Wild Venison, Scottish Wild Quality, yeah. the SQWA. Anyway. Um, the the Scottish Quality Wild Venison Association, and they've been discuss d- discussing and trying to work out the best routes to market and the best marketing and the best ways of getting that into people's homes. I think the problem with venison is that it's daunting for people to cook. People yeah, are worried about cooking it properly. As a sausage, as a sausage or a burger, I mean, or mince, yeah, or like you the, know, I mean, those those are three different cuts, if you will, that yeah. anybody can deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, uh, but I think the really interesting thing. So there's a great company. Um, I think it's a great company. They look like a great company called the Ethical Butcher. Have you mm-hmm. come across the yeah. Ethical Butcher? Yep. So the Ethical Butcher is a regenerative agriculture focused um, business that sells uh, what they consider to be ethically sourced meat online. And I'm saying they consider not in the condescending way that that sounds, but just in a you know, it's somebody else's business and I'm not involved in it. Yeah. So from what I've seen, it's very ethical. It's very good. Focuses on regenerative agriculture. They sell venison. Um, but they sell park venison. Okay. Because they can, their angle is they are controlling what it's fed and that kind of thing. So that it's not been fed anything bad for it or the environment. I think that's the logic. Um, and that's almost like, the way their marketing is about that, I, I I actually read up on them after uh, listening to an interview with the guy on a podcast about regener- regenerative agriculture, which I, it's just something I find interesting. Um, and uh, and I read his like venison spiel, and I was kind of like, oh, that really like that's kind of a bit mean to my venison, you know? That's that's <laughs> that's like very much like this is the best venison because it's in a park and it's controlled and it's proper and you know everything's like. It's it's a very healthy and you know that's exactly what people are looking for when they're buying beef. They want someone that's you know controlling that in the name of the environment and and this that and the other. And I'm kind of like, well, but this is this cool thing that we don't need to farm. Like, yeah. This is naturally here, guys. Mm-hmm. All right, the Japanese seeker is supposed to be naturally in Japan, but you know we're definitely not putting drugs in them to make sure that they're growing 
quicker or anything like that. You know, this or is having very, to feed them. Yeah, we. You know, they have. A, this, yeah, they the, have the, this mountain <laughs> yes, that goes exactly. from here all the way north until you hit the sea. Yeah, uh, you know, they and they do very well on it. And I think the seeker, you know, we have we have had restaurants uh, in Edinburgh buying reds. Um, however, the uh, I think once once those guys were seeing the fat content, on <laughs> they're the like, seeker, we want more of this. It was like very much like, yeah, you can keep your red deer, Sam. That's fine. And I was like, oh, okay, that's all right. So red deer to the game dealer, and uh, yeah, pretty to much. The... Although to be fair, I you know I don't know. I think you can get a very good red hind, and you can get a very good red stag in the early season, yeah. which which also has a great fat content, and also is very tasty and not that testosterone gamey meat that people talk about. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. I think the pickiness is sometimes. I feel like even Lloyd, like I reckon if I picked the right red deer and picked the average seeker deer, Lloyd would struggle to tell them apart in a blind taste test. That's possibly a very very bold claim that I would regret. That's something we but, might need to do at some yeah, point. Yeah, um, I think I think I think a lot of like the way things are, the time of year things are killed, and uh, the the you know. If you a woodland red deer and a woodland seeker are, are far more applicable than like you know if we went and shot a seeker hind of the wood tomorrow morning we go and shoot a seeker hind of the wood, and then we go way out the hill and we shoot a seeker hind way out the hill that's like been sat in the wind for the last month, like who's going to have less fat on her? Yeah, the deer that's hidden behind a tree or the deer that's hidden behind its yeah, calf. Exactly. So I don't know. <laughs> I think I think red deer maybe get a bit of a hard rap because people get very wary about stags in the rut, and I understand that. Um. But the great thing is, is we're shooting a load of seeker deer and there's a market for at least some of them. And that's fantastic. Um, and it's a small market, you know, we're not, and it's very much about, from our point of view, I think it's about making um, a little bit of money. It's about not losing money on venison, actually. I think if it's... It, it's if crazy we, that that's a situation If we that broke even, even, then I'd be chuffed. And I'm not, you know, I'm not the accountant. I'm not entirely sure whether we're breaking even, but I can tell you that we're closer than we are selling stuff to the game dealer. Yeah, of course. Um, and the cost of running, you know, we we have almost definitely talked about this before on the podcast in a different um, different angle in, that, in terms of people buying stalking days and the cost of that. You know, the cost of venison doesn't get close to covering the cost of harvesting it in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can get a bit closer to covering those costs, if we can get closer to um, a, a sustainable food chain where I know that the miles being put on that carcass are from here to Edinburgh, um, and then it's getting eaten and enjoyed and, you know, someone like Lloyd or any of the chefs that we're dealing with, you know, they're great guys and they're excited about making their own stock from the bones that they are buying a whole carcass and they're using a whole carcass. Lloyd gets really excited about, like, slow roasting neck. Mm. And, and that's slow roast awesome many because, because so much venison that you see on menus in restaurants and pubs and things like that is, like, fillet of venison. Yeah, of course. It's haunt of venison. Like, it's what like, people understand. Like a great deal of meat. It's what people understand. It's what's seen as those prime cuts, and therefore it makes it exclusive. So again, people at home don't cook it because like, oh, well, I had this delicious fillet of venison. It was perfectly rare, and it must be, you know, it must be a nightmare to make such lovely, fancy venison. Whereas actually, if you went to Lloyd's, and it's like, seek a neck, seek a deer neck pie, which is <laughs> almost yeah. definitely how he doesn't write it on the menu, because... <laughs> I doubt that would sell very many. <laughs> ask him tomorrow. But if he, you know, if if he's if he's if you go into his restaurant and you have a really really delicious meal, and that meal is mince on toast, which he was telling me is is something he loves to cook. I love a good mince or, on toast. Or, um, you know, like I say, a neck in a stew or a pie. I also like. It's great that all that is being used, which I think it. It, it's it's probably all used from a game dealer, but it's not going to be used in the same way. You it's won't not know it from the neck. Dish. It'll be uh, exactly something. It'll be in that burger. Yeah, or it's the not going to be. It's not going to be celebrated for what it is, and I think that's a very like high and mighty thing to say about some meat in a lot of ways. But then we should be high and mighty, like especially someone that produces it. You should be high and mighty about what you produce, and you should be proud of it. So it makes me really happy that what we're producing here is. You know, it's not getting flown to Spain to get eaten by someone as, um, uh, you know, as, as a chorizo or wherever they, they use that as. Because I know that, you know, the continent's always been a massive market for Scottish venison. Um, it's not being used for that. It's not being, you know, blended down into Baxter's game broth with 
Christ knows what else. <laughs> it's very simply a carcass that's going to get used in its entirety in one little place. Um, and they're going to butcher it in that kitchen and then they're going to use those bones to make stock and that's going to be enjoyed by people. I think that's really nice. That's that a, awesome. That's a cool feeling. Um, and it's, you know, I'd like to think it's something that can be used by other people and um, that, you know, we could maybe supply some more restaurants and I'd love to see more of our carcasses being used in that. I'd like, I'd love to be doing more local stuff as well. Edinburgh's a long way away and there's great restaurants closer. Yeah, and Vanessa's um, just down the road. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I'd like to think, like I say, we're very much experimenting at the moment. It's a new thing. We're trying to make it work uh, and we're trying to make it viable in terms of our time and money and their time and their money. Um, and I'd love to see, you know, I, you think between here and Inverness, you've got, uh, sorry, between here and Edinburgh, you've got Inverness, you've got um, Aberdeen. Perth. You've got Aberdeen, kind of, if you do a bit of a detour. Yeah. You know, you've got There's Perth. no money left in Aberdeen now that oil's died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you've got Perth. You've got Sterling. You've got lots of places with lots yeah. of restaurants. And I'm sure lots of them serve venison. So, so, you know, let's work out how we're going to get that there. And uh, I think that's great. Um, well, I am very much looking forward to getting on the hill with you both tomorrow. Yeah, it should be fun. Hopefully it doesn't rain. Um, but yeah, it should be fun. I mean, a little bit of rain's okay. But if it was pissing down all day, that'd be a little disappointing. Yeah, very flat. But, no, I, I can't wait to get my, my legs out on the hill. Um, take some pictures and uh, tomorrow have a chat with Lloyd and sort of hear the chef side of it and hear some of his backstory because I, be I don't know a lot about him. I know no. a bit about his restaurant. I know what you've told me, um, but to hear this, the the experience from his side will yeah. be very. Cool. And he's much more interesting than me anyway, so that'll be that'll be a doddle. <laughs> well, Sam, thank you for coming back on the show. Don't worry. I think you you are the guest that's been on the most. No, after the show. Yeah, that's that's sad for you. I think <laughs> that is, um, yeah, that is that is that is an endorsement for me. But I feel sorry that you can't get some of your cooler guests on more often. Oh, they're, they're all, they're too, all just busy, too busy. <laughs> too busy being cool, Byron. Um, yeah, and we'll have to um, we'll have to see. So when are your so what's your next your like podcasting schedule? What have you got planned for the year? Do you have anything? Planned? Well, um, I'm going to try and be more not that I was undisciplined last year, but as I was explaining uh, in the kind of extended intro on the first show of 2022, uh, last year was just chaos for me. Mm. Uh, like being away, filming, writing, two volumes of Modern Huntsman. And it was just very hard to be consistent with the shows yeah. and to find the time to edit them and put them out. And also, um, and I said this on the last show, that I'd done it for a long time. And yeah, and you did I like was, one every two weeks for. Well, I was doing one a week yeah. in the first year of COVID. Yeah, just because I was like, I was sitting, I was in the states at the time, and like, I was sitting in a city, and why not? Yeah, you know? and I had a podcast studio that I could use. So it was really yeah. easy, and it was fun. But I was just a little burnt out, and I didn't, I didn't want to ever get to the point, and I don't want to ever get to the point where I don't feel like the conversations that I'm having are the best that I can do. Uh, because then I can't get the best out of my guests. And then I don't think that's very fair to ask somebody to listen to something that I don't feel is the best. That they can do. Yeah. And so I'd rather not like take a break and, you know, maybe not put something out, which, so there was a lot of gaps last year. Um, but I'm sort of, you know, I'm kind of looking ahead to 2022 and in a better place in terms of what I want to achieve this year and the kind of shows. And we've got some cool series like the Swarovski series, which is going to run for at least the first yeah, six I months. Yeah, so that the other day. Every... Jemima and I were driving around oh, Assin yes. listening to ben. the American, yeah, the yes. American bird watching man, whose yeah. name I can't remember, ben but Lister's. I thought it was a great podcast. Yeah, so that that's going to be out once a month, that kind Amazing. of format. And we've got Charles Post, who you're, I yeah. know you're rather fond of, and uh, some uh, another, like a whole heap of really cool guests that are going to be on that. And then, this kind of show where we wow. talk shit. And For the people that aren't cool enough to get any free source gear. Yeah, bad times. We're going to talk shit and have a long form conversation. How do I ascend to the lofty heights of the, the, the free source key podcast? Oh. I imagine you get, for going on it, you must get like some no, free no. I'm not as interested now. That's a shame. Um, although I think... Uh, a lot of them are Swarovski ambassadors who have been on. So a lot of them are actually yeah. are, are using their gear. So like qualified as more. Well, actually saying though. that, what you're, that's what you use anyway. I, I am a Swarovski. You do. You're, you're, you're a Swarovski rangefinder. I, not only am I a Swarovski fan, I'm a Swarovski snob when it comes to binoculars. Oh, you are. And actually recently I, um, I traded in my old Swarovski rangefinders for 
exactly the same model of Sorsky range riding binoculars. Why? Just because they were like five years old. And <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted the updated version. I just know. You probably could just... have sent it back to them and they would have refurbished. I did that. Oh, you did? Yeah, just before I sold them. Um, I sent them back for a refurb and then I got a new pair because I feel like they are, it's not even like, you know, people are like, oh, it's like a joiner's hammer, but it's not because the joiner like doesn't have to use this hammer to use all his tools. It's like a joiner's hand. <laughs> like that it's is like what binoculars are. Up. Yeah, it's, it's it's just like uh, you know, it is a constant, and they have like a horrible life. They do. Like what I would say is that uh, laughing as we were earlier about um, binocular harnesses, that is something I am such a fan of. I recommend to everybody like get a binocular harness and try and like love your binoculars because otherwise they bounce around, getting dragged through shit. Like mine live. So if you think like mine presently are outside on the dashboard of the Hilux, and it's probably like tonight's not cold, but for, like it could easily be minus ten a night at this time of year and then you know half six seven o'clock tomorrow morning i'm gonna put the hilux on power heat crank the air conditioning <laughs> up and spend like so 10 you minutes your getting well. really hot so yeah. they go from freezing cold to really hot <laughs> they then get out and go back into the freezing cold like they they fall off the dashboard because many I leave, times. like many times they bounce off the indicator column <laughs> <laughs> and then they land like hopefully they land on a part of my body and catch got often they like, bounce off my elbow you know like they just have the shittest time so I feel if you do what I do for a living then like buying a pair of binoculars for life is not a good idea um, although so before I have my fancy Swarovski rangefinders I have a set like my first pair of binoculars are a set of Swarovski SLC mm-hmm. 7 yeah, 42s. Them, yeah. And mine are in that pale green color. I that love they that color. Only made for like the 80s. Yeah. Um, my friend still has a pair of 8 by 30 in that same color, which I have wanted to buy off him for years because they're a beautiful little binocular. And I genuinely, if I didn't need a rangefinder, I would never have gone away from those SLCs. They are more comfortable to hold than the. You see, this is why I'm never going to get sponsored. <laughs> they're, they're like, they're more comfortable to hold than anything else. And you never, like, I find the, the, the rangefinders, and this is not a big problem because it's focusing them, but I focus them a lot. Mm-hmm. Like in the course of a day, I'll focus. I will look at things. I'm focused on binoculars. Those old SLCs, I pick up and look at stuff, and I don't need to focus them. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because I've got weird eyes. I've no idea. But that pair of binoculars, which are now thirty odd years old and got reserviced and like re-nitrogen filled because they're a bit foggy and a bit knackered, yeah. um, they're still going. And that Amazing. and those I won't smell. Like I'll swap my rangefinders, but I will not get rid of those because they're a great binocular. It's an eight thirty that I have now. Yeah, you yeah. see, I like for the hill. I would have eight by thirty twos or eight by thirties or whatever they yeah. are. Yeah, these are the Every ones I use. Time. For the hill. Yeah, yeah I would always have those. But I have the eight by forty twos. I don't like tens because they make my eyes sore. I have a pair of ten forty twos, which were the first pair I ever bought. I was nineteen yeah. years old uh, when I bought them. A pair of punch, a pair of Carlos. Yeah, and I still have them. Yeah, but they make my eyes sore. It's funny if, isn't I, it? if I have to do a lot of scanning. Yeah, whereas I like eights. And I always have, so I always have a telescope. So I always have like my, if I'm on the hill, I always have either a Graze or a Ross draw scope, um, which is 20 something power or 30 power, like a lot of power. So power. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't need, I don't need 10 powers because I will look at stuff in detail with the telescope. And in the woods, like I always think if you could have six powers, then I would. Um, but yeah, I was always, I always wanted, I always wanted back in the day, I always wanted a seven by 50 Swarovski habit scope. That yeah, was, you still see them every now and then. Well, they, they, no, did they, was it a seven by 50? They do, they still, you still see eight by fifties. They're no, quite I th- common. I think they did. There was, was a seven. Was seven by 50. There was a seven something. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the eight by fifties, you still see a lot of, um, and that's a great scope because 56 mil, like I wouldn't have another, I have a 56 mil objective lens on my Berman rifle. But other than that, it's a I'm lot of scope though. Forty twos, yeah. like uh, my stalking rifle, my like estate stalking rifle's got a four to sixteen by forty four scope on it, yeah. and I just wouldn't have a bigger objective lens than that. Yeah. They're too big, they're too heavy, they get in the way. I think fifty is the biggest I have. Yeah, fifty's good. My um, one of my night forces is a fifty, and that's a nicer size. But my vermin rifle's got the big attacker on it, and mm. that's a clunky. It weighs like one point three kilos. <laughs> So the, the beast. scope, yeah, the beast. Um, but anyway, this all goes. We're finishing up. And we were finishing up. Well, well, just to, to finish up the, the 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 question that you asked me, I do have the one of the really sort of exciting things, other than the Swarovski series, is that, and it's sitting on my desk, 
well, kind of on my desk right now. I'm, I'm working on it. Is um, a really quite highly edited podcast series that might be three, possibly four episodes. They were all recorded in Mozambique at Cotado 11 during the Cheetah relocation. And we in I interviewed seven or eight different people from biologists to Dan Cabela, uh, who's amazing chairman of the um, Cabela Family Foundation. So Cabela, the big, I mean, it's now it's since been sold from that family, but uh, most people will know the name. Um, particularly in the US. And they're amazing as, camouflage from the 80s. Yeah, so when they, they made some incredible products you know, back in the day, particularly. Um, so there's this incredible spectrum of people that I'm interviewing, but I also have a, a lot of field recordings while things were happening because one, I recorded audio almost the whole time, but two, I was also filming some behind the scenes stuff, so I've pulled the audio from that. So it's going to be, it's not just going to be, oh, here you're listening to Willem, the biologist. It's going to be an integrated podcast where you hear from multiple people and you, you, you hear what it was like for me to go out at one or two in the morning or whenever it was and go and dart a leopard out of the tree in the dark, having been bayed with dogs. And you're That's going to be cool. in that environment. You're going to hear the dogs baying. You're going to hear the commotion of everybody and, and hopefully be feel like you're seeing it, but through audio. That's my ambition for this. So it's a lot of work to put a show together like that. Yeah. Um, so there's probably going to be maybe three episodes, but I'm, I'm working on it right now, and it's kind of exciting to be reliving some of that. Yeah. Sounds a lot harder than being sit, sat, sitting, whatever we're doing, in my living room, having a pint. I mean, it's, a, it, it's more exciting to go and do, because yes. it would be like, and I nearly thought about doing the, this tomorrow, but I'm, I'm busy taking pictures tomorrow. Um, was recording some, like having you both mic'd up tomorrow and you're doing the stalking and pulling some of the conversations that you have, many not, of which could not, never be used. Not, not the heavy breathing. <laughs> the heavy breathing. <laughs> and integrating that into a show. But it is a lot of work to be able to do that. But I would like to be in a position like we were able to, to do it um, because uh, a lot of the, the content that we've created, whether that be the stories in the new volume of Modern Huntsman, yeah. Um, around the Mozambique story have been funded by the Campbell Family Foundation. So we've had the ability to have a bit more time to be able to do that, to highly produce a podcast yeah, that's series. that's really cool. To um, put the behind-the-scenes stuff together, to tell the stories, which is it's great to have the privilege of being able to do that because it's the kind of stuff that I really do enjoy yeah. doing, but it does take more time. And also it's just, it's a great, I think there's so much, you know, you can look at those things, can't you? And you can look at that that effort and that project and you can be like this is amazing they've you know and i don't know the details they've taken these cheetahs from here and they've put them there and that's great for cheetahs well done or leopards uh well it? so they were they were relocating cheetah okay but we did collar a leopard as okay well. um but you know they so you can look at that and be like yeah that's an amazing story and i think that's a that in itself is worth talking about and that's great i think it's so much more interesting especially for people like me that aren't necessarily a naturally scientific person like i'm quite a i don't know i'm I'm definitely not an artistic person but i'm not a scientific person i think numbers and things i, I struggle with a bit so being having you like you say that behind the scenes like how it actually works like clicks with my brain so much more I'm, yeah. I, I'm a practical person that's what i am neither an artist nor a scientist just a man with a spade <laughs> and for, for me that like <laughs> who looks at brown things in brown, brown places, places. That great line <laughs> um yeah that uh that like things like that where you can kind of start to understand how you go about it like how that guy that does that for a living does that every day yeah. and how he like how he thinks about it in that daily way i think it's really cool well that's that hopefully the insight you're going to get well that will be exciting we're, we're, i might start with, listening with the to audio <laughs> with the audio recording of actually you can't hear a hell of a lot in the, in the helicopters but i did have a mic in the headset so you can hear a little bit of the chatter oh, amazing but i mean just to paint a 15 second picture well the vet who's part of this operation is hanging out the side of a helicopter as we're chasing down a lion running through the long grass, darting it in the ass. That's like cool. that's what you're going to hear. That's cool. Once, uh, once we put all that. My, my, the thing I really want, just in case anybody does want to sponsor me. Um, <laughs> what I do you want? A I want gun. a net gun. A net gun for your trainees? <sighs> yeah. I don't know. I just, I saw one recently. I've never seen one in the flesh before. Uh, and I was at my rifle smith and he, he's, he's got one. Um, okay yeah he's got a net gun i can't remember why but it was for some like very logical net gunning thing rather than me who just wanted one they're like five thousand pounds they fire a 308 blank um and i was huh. just like yeah oh so there's quite a lot of oomph behind that yeah they go like 20 meters huh so the kiwi thing you know they catch stags and stuff i was just like that would be handy 
It's like, you know. <laughs> he doesn't know like, what for, but. Well, when well, my tackle runs away, <laughs> thump, there is... you go. Have a net gun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, if someone wants to sponsor me, please be a net gun maker. That would be excellent. Okay, the call is out, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and with that revelation, yeah. um, thank you very much for coming on the show again. It, it is always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, tomorrow. It, I think it is. I think it is still tomorrow, not today. I don't think we've been talking that long. Is no. It before twelve o'clock, it is tomorrow. When did we start? I don't know, but we have been talking for a while. Ah, well. But we tomorrow we are on the hill. Excellent. Look forward to it.